studying on the pre-tribulation rapture, and um, we have given a defense for pre-trib, and tonight we're going to look at 12 problems with a post-tribulation rapture. If we have time, we'll do a Q&A. If we don't, we'll carry it on. So, number one, <clears throat> a post-tribulation rapture would provide a measurable time frame defiling the doctrine of imminency. We talked about this last week, uh, imminency being uh, a problem for the mid-tribbers. It's also, of course, in this case, a, a, a major problem for the post-tribbers. But in this case, I'm not really looking at imminency as much as I am the idea of a measurable timeline. Uh, let's look at the scripture, and then I'll make some elaborations on this. Uh, Daniel chapter 12 from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, now the daily sacrifice is taken away halfway through the tribulation period. We'll cover this in greater detail in our next study, which is the attributes of the tribulation, uh, which will follow after uh, this presentation tonight, a couple of weeks from now. Um, so when the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, uh, Antichrist sets himself up to be worshipped as God in the temple and so forth. Uh, there shall be 1,290 days. Okay, wh why am I pointing that out? Well, let me finish the verse. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the end, or, or uh, comes to the 1,335 days. I know what you're thinking. What's that? Why is there a different number? Uh, let's not get bogged down with that right now. I'll, I'll just tell you it's theorized that that's the time that uh, there will be some lag between the second coming and the uh, judgment of the sheep and goats before the millennium begins. There's other dates and times involved. But here's the thing. If the abomination of desolation takes place at the time that the sacrifice is taken away, and we already know that that is going to happen in the middle of the tribulation week of years, so three and a half years in, uh, he breaks the covenant with Israel and he sets himself up at, in the temple as God to be worshipped as God. That is the abomination of desolation. We can calculate the number of days that will, it will be until the second coming. So imminency is out. And if no one knows the day or the hour of the rapture, now you got a problem because as soon as you hit the three and a half year mark and the abomination of desolation takes place, now you've got three and a half years where the, the scripture is faulty because then now somebody will know, anyone that calculates the number will know the day or the hour. And so it doesn't work. Uh, so the, the time frame is calculable. Number two, uh, the post-tribulation rapture fails to see the distinction between Israel and the church and of God's covenant with and promised restoration of Israel. Uh, this is probably also very important if you are a covenantalist, a reformed theolo theologian, uh, embrace re uh, inform, uh, reformed theology, because they don't really see a distinction between Israel and the church, and they don't see a uh, spiritual restoration of the nation and people of Israel as peculiar or distinct from the rest of the nations of the earth. A lot of millennial or uh, all millennialists or well, let's say reformed theologians will tell you God is going to restore Israel just like he's going to restore all the other nations which relate to the new heavens and the new earth. But that's not what the Bible is talking about when it talks about the restoration of Israel. This is a time when God is going to gather his own people and he's going to rebuild the nation and people of Israel. They will be the head of all the nations. Christ will rule from Jerusalem as uh, king of Israel and uh, effectively king of the whole world. So king of kings and lord of lords. And so uh, the post-tribulation rapture fails to see the distinction between Israel and the church uh, Romans chapter 11, again, we're getting into kind of some stuff where you got to think a little bit. For I do not desire, Paul is talking to the Romans, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion 
that blindness in part has happened to Israel, and this key word, until. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so if there's an until, that means that there's something to anticipate, right? And so this is obvious. God is going to do something very unique in restorative work with Israel. So he does not want us, Paul does not want us, God does not want us uh, to be ignorant of this mystery that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The fullness of the Gentiles and the times of the Gentiles will come to a conclusion at the end of the tribulation period. We know that. They will trample the city underfoot until the Lord returns to rescue Israel. Uh, this is We could spend a whole night on just that one topic. Into the tribulation, God restores Israel. Romans 11 also uh, I say then, have they, that is Israel, stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world, and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So how, the how much more their fullness is important. Because now we're dealing with the fact that there is going to be a future fullness for Israel. And so there is a, clearly a distinction between Israel and the church and what God is doing with Israel. So all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And this will not happen until the second coming. And so this is the second coming is post-trib. The rapture is not. And so very clearly spelled out for us. Uh, is uh, Israel in sin today? Yes. Are they in rebellion against God? Is their government a, a, a filled with problems? Is there sorcery and idolatry and all kinds of stuff going on in Israel today? Yes. And yet Ezekiel thirty-eight thirty-nine tells us that there will be a day that from that day, when God makes himself known to them, they see him face to face, that there will no longer be idolatry. There will no longer be the false prophet. That they will, from that day forward, uh, know him from the least of them to the greatest, saith the Lord. Number three, a post-tribulation rapture fails to see the purpose of the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are, need a little tutoring on Daniel 9? All right, okay, a few of you, a couple of you. Thank you for being willing to raise your hand because everyone else that didn't raise their hand also needs the tutoring. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, after the children of Israel were in Babylon, I'll probably be a little redundant here, but once they were exported to Babylon because of their rebellion against the Lord and their disobedience related to the land, uh, they are in... Uh, the, the clutches of Babylon for 70 years. After 70 years, Daniel is praying and said, okay, Lord, it's time. 70 years has gone by, now what? And so God is dealing with the children of Israel and tells Daniel, look, um, here's a problem. Uh, it's like good news, bad news, right? <laughs> Seven, 70 years has passed, which I told you you'd go into captivity for 70 years, but I also told you if you don't repent during the 70 years, then I'm gonna visit the iniquity uh, seven times. So that means seven times 70, which equals 490 years. And so now we got a problem because you got a 490 year timeline that is yet to be fulfilled. Uh, and, the, and the 70 years in Babylon didn't do it because they didn't repent. Now we know from the book of Daniel that there were a few, a handful of individuals in Babylon that did in fact serve the Lord. Uh, four people come to mind right away. Daniel himself, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But otherwise, you remember when Nebuchadnezzar said, everybody bow down and worship my statue? Remember that big golden image that he made of himself and says, worship? Uh, there's only three guys that got thrown in the fire. Uh, where's everybody else? Bowing down, right? Uh, uh, so you've got some things to consider there uh, in relationship to Israel and their disobedience. 
So what is the purpose of the 70 weeks? Well, it is a, it's a disciplinary action. So here's an observation uh, that is related to the disciplinary action and the purifying of Israel that is why God has intended the tribulation period as part of the 490 years. Uh, many people will contend that the tribulation is designed to purify the church. I'm just going to point this out as an observation. If this were true, then all church-age saints would have to be resurrected and allowed to go through the tribulation. Uh, so if they weren't purified and the tribulation, therefore, is designed to purify, then what happens to those guys, the ones that have already gone ahead of us, the dead in Christ? They'd have to be resurrected to go through the tribulation. Think about the irony of that kind of theology. No, uh, you've been purified and made white in the blood of Jesus. And so that's just something I want to point out as part of it. So why the 70 weeks? Or 70 heptads, uh, groups of seven. Uh, to bring the children of Israel to their knees. That's the point. And this is exactly what happens during the tribulation period. They are driven to their knees. Uh, they come to that point where they literally cry out to the Lord. Uh, Zechariah tells us that uh, God will give them a spirit of grace and supplication and they will call upon him and God will grant them their request for grace and he will bring restoration to them. But uh, bringing them to their knees uh, because of their disobedience. And so I'm going to highlight what got them into Babylon and what they didn't do properly in uh, in. Uh, relationship to that discipline and this is in the law leviticus 25 you guys are familiar to a little degree at least speak to the children of israel and say to them when you come into the land which i give you then the land shall keep a sabbath to the lord the land shall keep a sabbath to the lord six years you shall sow your field and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit so for six years you can plant and harvest, but on the seventh year, you have to let the land rest. But the children of Israel disobeyed the Lord. They didn't give the land its Sabbath rest. So God said, I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbath. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest for the time it did not rest on your Sabbath when you dwelt in it. Again, this is a part of the uh, passage in prophecy in Leviticus, part of the law. So God sent the children of Israel into Babylon because of their disobedience, because they did not let the land rest, to give it a, that Sabbath rest. So he said, I have set my face against this city, for adversity and not for good, says the Lord, and it shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. And so, as you know, the temple was destroyed, and Babylon took the Israelis captive and so forth. So he did exactly what he said he would do. God told the children of Israel after this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. So that's where that 70 times seven comes from. Uh, that's your Daniel 9. Why, why is Daniel 9 such a, a key element in understanding the end times? Well, this is why. A lot of people don't know that part of the prophecy. So nearing the end of the 70 year exile, Gabriel speaks to Daniel. I've mentioned this to you already. I, I cited it for you. 70 weeks or 70 hept seven heptads, 70 groups of seven, um, 490 years are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. And again, we could spend all night on this verse. Okay, so to finish the transgression. See, we've got to clean up this entire mess to make an end of sins. Has that happened yet? No. Uh, to bring in everlasting righteousness, that will not happen until the king of righteousness comes with healing in his wings and he reigns in Jerusalem. Uh, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. 
and the, Jesus is going to be anointed as King of kings and Lord of lords during the millennial kingdom. So that is still future. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, uh, but this is, remember, this is the city, not the temple, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, or a total of 69 weeks of years. So 69 times 7, 483. Um, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, so you got seven, and then the, and they come and go, and then the 62, which will come and go. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. So the Messiah is going to come and, and be noted as having come after the 483 years. Now, this is an important passage. Um, I'll jump ahead a little bit, but don't, don't let me lose you. Um, this is the exact day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, to the day. So from the command to go and rebuild the city and its walls until the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, on what we call Palm Sunday, was exactly to the day, 483 years. And Jesus even mentioned this when he talked to the Pharisees who were rebuking his disciples for crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they, they told Jesus, tell your disciples to be quiet. And he says, if the disciples are quiet, even the rocks will cry out. Remember this passage. And then he looks at the Pharisees and said, if you had known even this thy day, the things that make for your peace. And they were, to, they were being held accountable to know this thy day. So they were able to calculate to the day that, that when the Messiah would be present and, and introduced, which is exactly what happened into Jerusalem on that particular day. Now, of course, you can backtrack that to, you know, when Anna and Simeon saw him in the temple when he was dedicated as a baby, and then the ministry they did around uh, Israel and mostly around the Galilee. But this was the unofficial introduction of the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world on Palm Sunday. So the Messiah will be cut off. Well, when, how, where? At the cross. That's what happened. And it happened exactly as was described in the Bible. Four days after um, uh, he was introduced into Jerusalem. And exactly as the law would prescribe, uh, the children of Israel were to take the little lamb into their house on Nisan 10. Four days later, they would kill it at twilight, Nisan 14. That was Passover. And J Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Nisan 10, and he was crucified on Nisan 14. Uh, to the day, exactly fulfilling the prophecy, so the Messiah was cut off. Of course, then you have the problem of the church age, which is a bit of an interruption in the timeline of Israel. Now, a lot of people don't like this, uh, especially covenant theologians, uh, preterists, that is those persons that believe that all the uh, eschatology has been fulfilled, or a great majority of it has been a partial preterist, meaning a great majority has been fulfilled already. Uh, uh, we are premillennial, pre-tribulational. We don't believe it's been fulfilled yet. And so we're seeing the church age as an interruption in God's timeline with Israel. It is not an interruption in God's timeline because God knew from before the foundations of the world everything he was going to do, and he's doing it. But it is an interruption in the 490-year timeline. So the church becomes that interruption, the church age. Uh, the people, the prince, that is the Antichrist, who is to come, which he, and he does come during the tribulation. We know this. He starts uh, uh, his uh, so-called rule, reign, uh, with a peace treaty with Israel. He signs a peace treaty among the nations surrounding Israel uh, to give a, a certain level of peace Israel, and in the middle of the week, that is the 70th week of Daniel 9, or this, the last seven years, in the middle of that seven years, he will break the covenant. That is when he sets himself up as God, and that's the abomination of desolation. Again, we could study all night on just that. Uh, he shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, the end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the wars, des uh, war desolations are determined. Then the Antichrist shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, that is seven years, but in the middle of the week, after three and a half years, these insertions are mine, 
he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. That is, he stops the Jews from sacrificing in the temple. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And so these people are uh, they're hungry for God. They're desolate of God's presence. They're in trouble. Uh, there's wars and, and all kinds of activity going on. And the abomination that, of desolation that takes place when he sets himself up as God, the middle of the tribulation, and this is all going to come to a fruition uh, when the Lord returns at the second coming, not the rapture. Okay, so now we're at number four, and you probably have 100 questions already, right? Hold those thoughts if you would. Number four, post-tribulation rapture violates the study in typology. I'm going to go through this one kind of quickly. You guys understand typology, what I mean by typology? Old Testament pictures that are fulfilled in the New Testament or described in the New Testament that we understand more fully. So just like the tabernacle is a type of Christ and there's all kinds of things going on in the Old Testament, patterns and actions that happen that actually uh, are documentable uh, I believe that is a word, actually, too. So there it is, uh, uh, it, it, from the New Testament. So Genesis, um, Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. So this is a type. Before the flood of Noah, God took the one guy that was walking with the Lord, Enoch. So he was raptured. He didn't have a death. So that's an uh, interesting typology. So it's before the judgment, before the flood. Now Noah and his uh, wife and their three sons and their three wives eight people in all, they got inside the ark. So in my view, in the typology, Enoch represents the church and Noah and his family represent Israel. And so you have to go through this process with me and figure out if I'm a heretic. Number eight, uh, number eight, B. Lot was removed from Sodom before the judgment. You know this. So remember Abraham's dialoguing with the Lord. Well, if there's 50 guys, what if there's 40 guys, etc. Hurry and escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. So he, the angel tells um, Lot, look, you got to escape, because I can't do anything until you're out of the way. You got to get out of here. And see, again, there's a type. God's not going to part his judgment on the righteous. And Lot was a righteous guy, according to Peter. Now, I have doubts about Peter on this, but no, not really. <laughs> see, that's a whole Bible study by itself, too. Guy, we could just have a lot of fun tonight, couldn't we? I could just start right here and, and wing it, and then we could come back to this. Um, why was Lot a righteous guy, according to the Lord? God inspired Peter to write that righteous man who vexed his soul from day to day living among them. Talking about living in Sodom and living with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. His soul was vexed. He was grieved in his spirit by them. He still lived among them. Uh, when the angels came, he offered his daughters to the angels uh, who wanted to have sexual relations with these men that they saw come in, that they were two angels. And he says, I can't let them have these angels. This is, you know, they're my guests. You can have my daughters. What? You know, that righteous man? I got issues. Um, and then, of course, you know the rest of the story. But now, why was he righteous? Not by works, by faith. That is a huge Bible study all by itself. The Rock. Um, this is one of my favorites. Uh, Numbers chapter 20. Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly. And the congregation and their animals drank, and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me, you didn't trust me, you didn't believe me, or hollow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Now, you guys are familiar with this Somewhat familiar, if you're not, let me just tell you. When God led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and he was providing for them in the wilderness, initially they said, look, you took us out here to die. You know, we're, we're starving to death, and we're thirsty, and you know this, this is bad. We want to go back to Egypt. And God is approached by Moses, and the, Moses sort of complains to the Lord and says, man, the people are complaining against me, and now I'm going to complain to you. What are you going to do about this? And God says, okay, go and um, strike the rock, and it, water will come forth. And so that was the first time. This is the second time uh, in this context when we, when we see this happen again, where they don't have water. And the Lord says to uh, Moses, go and speak to the rock. 
But he was angry and he was frustrated and he was human and he struck the rock the second time. Now this defiled the type because in the book of Hebrews, we learned that the rock that followed them was Christ. Amen. And so Christ died once for all and the typology won't work. Now, why am I bringing this up for a post-trib rapture? Because the, if you re realize the purpose of the tribulation which is to bring Israel to its knees. And if you know that the church has been made purified and therefore we don't have to go through the tribulation to be purified, otherwise we have to resurrect all those that are dead in Christ already so that they have to go through the tribulation to be purified. And therefore you know that the church is already pure. And the reason that the church is pure is because the church is in Christ, then you can't be struck or you're striking Christ again. You, do I need to explain that again? Okay, so you are hidden with Christ in God. You have been made the righteousness of God in him. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I could quote after verse after verse of all the in Christs, all right? And so if you're in Christ and then you have to be struck by God to somehow purify you, then the work of the cross has been insufficient. The work of Christ is insufficient. Christ has to punish you to make you righteous. Wait, we're not Catholic. Okay, there is no purgatory because you've been purged of all of your sins already. Amen? All right, so this would defile the type. God removes the righteous before he judge, uh, judges. And you must know this. So with Daniel and the dating, the 400 and some years when Jesus came into the, on the donkey. Yeah. Did, is there any knowledge of people knowing that at that time? And if not, when did people start knowing about that or realizing that? Okay, are you, you're talking about people that were alive in real time when Jesus rode in the, on the donkey. The Bible does not tell us that there were people that recognized that at that time. The Magi knew it. About his birth. Okay. Uh, they, yeah. I mean, so, about this time frame. Yeah, the whole time frame, yes. But about the actual day that he rode the donkey in, the people were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, which means save us now or save now. So were there people that knew? Maybe. Does the Bible say that there were people that knew? No. There's nowhere in the Bible that says, and this group of people knew what was going on. So uh, the disciples didn't even know what was going on. Remember, there's so much activity. By the time you get past that day and everybody's celebrating, Hosanna, Hosanna, remember the same people that were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, now I'm speaking in generalities, they only two, three days later said, crucify him. The mob, the whole mass of the people of Israel said, Hosanna, save us now. We want to be delivered from Rome. We want to be, have the Messiah come. If, the, if you're the Messiah, save us, and then we'll know that you're the Messiah. The way he saved them wasn't the way they planned. So, now It's possible that Sir Robert Anderson could have been the first guy to actually discover this because he did a lot of forensic study on the dates and times so in the 1800s, he started looking at the math of all this Daniel 9 stuff and what was going on. And so it is possible that few, if anybody, knew about it until uh, Robert Anderson brought it up. There's a lot of um, big name kind of calling of what camp we're in. Are you Arminian, the Reform? So yeah, I'm not so sure that I necessarily would argue too much, too much with the sola gratia, for example, grace alone, sola so, fide, faith alone, right. uh, sola scriptura, scriptures alone. I mean, the, the solas, we, we believe, and we embrace candlelight would be a church that mm -hmm. would endorse all of the five solas. Um, there's two camps, te technically, in ma when you're talking about the mass of the church age and people in the church. The, the one camp is called covenant theology and the other is dispensational theology. You, you usually fall into one of two camps. And there's probably some obscure groups out there that have something else. 
uh, within each camp, there are subgroups. So you have uh, covenant theologians that are amillennial, for example. They don't believe that there is any millennium, literal. Uh, and then there is the post-millennialist that believe that it's not literal, but that there's actually a period of time that has to be accomplished before the Lord can come back, etc. So you have subgroups within covenant theologian circles. You also have subgroups within dispensational circles. For example, many people accuse dispensationalists of being cessationists. Cessationism means that we don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that God's not doing anything miraculous. I completely reject that on the basis of good dispensational theology. Because if you understand what dispensations are, it's a form of administration. And so if God has set up an administration that started on the day of Pentecost and ends at the day of the rapture, then no changes have taken place between the day of Pentecost and the day of the rapture. And so if there has been this idea that only during the first century were the manifestations of the Spirit, and then they ceased at the end of the death or the death of the last apostle or at the end of the first century, then there has been an administrative change. Therefore, two dispensations fall into the dispensation of the church. Now you have two dispensations. No, there isn't. And there's a number of reasons why we know that. Primarily because there's no divine worldwide judgment after the first century. And the, the gateways from each dispensational start and stop is a divine worldwide judgment. The, for, the one at the beginning is the cross, and the one at the end is the second coming, right? You're following me? Or the, uh, the rapture. The rapture is the end of the church age. So the rapture is the divine worldwide judgment. Uh, you think, well, it's not a judgment to us. That's right, because you're never going to be judged again because you were judged at the cross. But when you are taken away, everybody left behind, they're judged. So it, it is a divine worldwide judgment for you to disappear. Uh, we were talking about this this morning in staff meeting with uh, Laban and Jacob working for Laban. He says, man, as long as you're here, we're blessed. And when Laban, when Jacob wanted to leave, uh, he says, don't leave. You know, let's work this out. Because uh, he knew he was blessed as long as Laban was there. Well, the world is going to be really happy when they find out we're gone. When, when the rapture happens and all the Christians disappear and everybody that voted for Trump is gone. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Anyway, so in the dispensational camp, you can't be a true dispensationalist and also be a cessationist, uh, in my view. And so um, there's all kinds of subgroups. There's, there are dispensationalists that are mid-tribbers. There are dispensationalists that are post-tribbers. Uh, no, it doesn't work. That's what we're dealing with right now trying to prove to you and show you why mid-trib and post-trib won't work. And I, I hope that we're doing a fair job thus far on that. So um, does that answer your question a little bit? So covenant theology, dispensational theology. Reformed theology is covenant theology. So it's, it's kind of one and the same. Uh, the re first of the reformers, of course, you know, Martin Luther. Uh, then you had uh, uh, John Knox and... Uh, John Calvin, the, the Calvinism, Calvinists. Um, uh, you've, you had John Huss. John Huss and the Hussites were burned at the stake. You guys probably know a little of this stuff, if not a lot, depending on your studies in church history. But um, the, the Calvinism of our day is interesting too because you are now dealing with Calvinist dispensationalist and Calvinist New uh, Covenantalists, both. Uh, John MacArthur is a Calvinist dispensationalist, and it upsets all the Calvinists. Uh, and then you've got guys that are non-Calvinists that, um, that are covenantal. But most Covenantalists are also Calvinists. And so this is where you have this kind of funny subgroupings within the two camps, co Covenantalists and, and uh, Dispensationalists. Calvinism is another issue because Calvinism is more than soteriology. Soteriology is the study of our salvation. Uh, so if you're thinking of Calvinism and soteriology, you're talking about the doctrines of salvation. He, he didn't believe in the future of Israel. He didn't come out far enough. The Reformation for uh, Martin Luther, for example, was partial Reformation. We needed more Reformation. That's where we are today. See, we're, we're reformers of the reformers is what we are te technically because we're looking deeper and saying, now hold on a minute. 
Since 1948, we have absolute reason to believe that God's going to restore Israel. Before 1948, it was kind of vague to a lot of people. In 1948, a lot of people burned their commentaries and started rewriting everything uh, because Israel was recognized as a nation by the United Nations, etc. So, um, so teriology, you know, irresistible grace and, and uh, uh, perseverance of the saints, limited atonement, uh, uh, a total depravity, etc. That is the soteriological side of Calvinism, uh, and then you've got your eschatological. Uh, which is the study of the end times, and your Israelological uh, that are also problematic. So even like Lutherans today, some of them believe in transubstantiation, that the elements of the bread and wine become the, the actual body of Christ, and others believe that they are symbolic. The Roman Catholics believe, uh, they're, you know, they predate, of course, Martin Luther and the Reformation. They believe that the transubstantiation actually happens, that miraculously the bread and wine actually become the literal, physical, miraculously manifested body and blood of Jesus. So probably another whole day of just Bible study on that. But thank you. So just to be clear, um, Messianic Jews, they will be part of the rapture, correct? Yeah. Okay. So well, if they believe in Jesus as Messiah, which is what they're well, called Messianic, Messianic Jews. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. So yeah. um, do you, are there any scriptures that you know of that speak specifically about the Messianic Jewish people? Yeah, pretty much the whole New Testament. Because... Well, I mean, as far as like them in the end times. In what? Say them in the end times. Um, well, during the tribulation, 144,000 will be Messianic Jews. Um, there's going to be a lot of people in Israel that will be saved during the tribulation. They will be Messianic Jews. Uh, church age Messianic Jews, yes, yeah. because... Uh, the gospel goes forth to Jew, Gentile, male, female, bond, free, and it goes to this, every group the same way. The gospel goes first to the Jew, then also to the Gentile. I could give you a, probably half a dozen or more scriptures right now. Uh, Paul the apostle was a Jew. He was, a, uh, you know, and so were the others. And everyone he ministered to initially were in the synagogues, and then he went to the Gentiles. And so every Jewish person that got saved during the early first century church age period uh, they were all Messianic Jews. The, right. All the early disciples were Jews, according to some theologians. Somebody argues about Luke and so forth, but I don't know. Maybe I think Luke was a Jew too. So, so the question was, if, uh, if no one knows the day or the hour, and we could calculate the day or the hour based on the abomination of desolation, then Jesus would end up knowing when the second coming would occur. Nobody is supposed to know the day of the second coming. That's the point I'm making that you could calculate based on the timeline of the, of the tribulation period to the day when the, the second coming will occur. But you cannot do that about the rapture. Now, I suspect that Jesus now knows the day or the hour, the day and the hour, because all power has been given to me in heaven and earth. He's in heaven now. But when he said that at that time, in his earthly physical body, pre-resurrection, no one knows the day or the hour, not even the Son, but the Father, right? He didn't know at the time because Jesus had to learn, just like everybody else, when he was in his physical form pre-resurrection. So he was, a, he was a fully man, fully God. And the Bible says he learned by the things that he endured or suffered, if you're reading the King James. So does that help? So yeah, keep a distinction between the second coming and the rapture. Big differences in the two events. Okay, so we're out of time, you guys. Thank you for your patience.